الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى اما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في القران المجيد والفرقان الحميد ونزلنا عليك الكتاب تبيانا لكل شيء صدق الله مولانا العظيم قال جل جلاله وأما نواله في شان حبيبه مخبر وآمرا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وصحبه وبارك وسلم عليه Allah Azza wa Jal has been very kind upon us to gather here and commence this journey into his book and what better evening could we commence this journey on than the evening of Nisfi Shaban Shabibira nothing in our life that happens is coincidental the clothes that you are wearing on your body didn't just coincidentally appear on your body there were several processes that were under um, that were underwent and as a result you wear the clothes that you are wearing so if the clothes on your body are not coincidental then your sitting here is not coincidental we are about to start a journey an unprecedented journey unprecedented means something that you wouldn't have tasted or experienced before but before we commence this journey we need to know some ground information if i introduce a book to you the first thing that you want to know about any book is what are its contents because its contents will dictate your interest So if I want to promote a book on uh, chemical engineering, most of you would be disinterested in that because that's not your line of interest. Those who have studied this topic would find it very useful. So everyone, according to their background, appetite and ambition, background, appetite and ambition will seek a book that fits that background appetite and ambition but the book that we are about to embark upon let's just look at the background of this to get a flavor of what we're about to get ourselves into this is not just about let's just read some verses translate it and go home this is a huge chapter of our life that we are about to start huge colossal and we will realize its hugeness just by understanding certain preliminary remarks allah azza wa jal when he intended to create this universe not this earth this universe Allah Azza wa Jal created a creation in which the data of this universe was inserted beforehand the data of this universe was inserted and using modern terminology because although the hadith terminology doesn't refer to these words but just to allow us to understand 
the data pertaining to this universe, the entire data from the coding to the practical manifestation of what is and is to be, that data was stored before this universe was created. And in order to uh, create that uh, hardware, Allah Azza wa Jal empowered, created and empowered a creation called Al Qalam. What was it called? Al Qalam. Al Qalam. Literally, it means pen. But don't think this is the pen that me and you have in your pocket. This isn't a pen which writes the way our pens write. This is a creation of Allah called Al Qalam. And Allah Azza wa Jal, the Prophet educated us in a hadith, Allah created the Qalam first. And then he educated the Qalam and then ordered the Qalam and said, Uktub, write. When the Qalam was ordered to write, what did it write? The words of the hadith are فَكَتَبَ مَا كَانَ وَمَا It wrote everything about this universe that was and was to be. So there is no data about this universe that was not the subject of writing of the Qalam. Where did the Qalam write this? On a piece of paper? No. The hard drive where the Qalam wrote everything was called the Lohe Mahfuz. Lohe Mahfuz. Remember these terms. Qalam, Lohe Mahfuz. What is the knowledge of the Qalam? Ma kana wa ma yakun. Everything that was and everything that everything that will be. This is the parameter of the knowledge of Al Qalam. And the Qalam then inscribed upon the database Mahfuz same knowledge. So you have two creations that have knowledge of Ma Kana wa Ma Yakun that which was and that which will be from the beginning of the universe to the end of the universe all the knowledge was contained in the Loi Mahfuz. That's a lot of knowledge. That's a lot of data. If I could say this to you that there is nothing in this universe the knowledge of which you cannot find in the Loi Mahfuz. Can you imagine the magnitude of the knowledge of Loi Mahfuz? Can you imagine how vast this knowledge is? Now, let's look at the Quran. I'm not going to go into detail, just a snapshot. The Loi Mahfuz is a small drop if the knowledge of the Qur'an. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, the Qur'an says itself, Lo uh, lo mahfuz. The Qur'an is in the law mahfuz. But just because it is in, doesn't mean it is inferior or it is smaller. Yeah. In means just that it has been parked in the Loi Mahfuz, but the knowledge of the Loi Mahfuz is not even a drop of the, uh, the knowledge of the Quran, is not in, the Loi Mahfuz is not even a drop of the knowledge of the Quran. So, can you imagine the vastness and the enormity of the knowledge of the Quran? This is very, very serious business. So then we are told by 
ulama, by speakers of all denominations, that the Quran is the biggest miracle of the Prophet. But what does this sentence actually mean? It is a miracle. If I say to you, this speaker is miraculous, the punchline is, well, show me. And if I can't show you the miracle, then it's just a sales pitch. It's just me talking. When we use the word miracle, we actually don't understand what this refers to. Because in our lives, let's be very honest with each other. What is our relationship to the Qur'an? We have two relationships to the Qur'an. Number one, we read it, open it up and read it, Dilawa, for sawab. Everyone agree? For sawab. Or alternatively, if someone passes away, we read it for Isa al sawab. But to read the Qur'an for sawab or Isa al sawab it's like uh, traveling. It's like having a the best uh, an example I could give you. It's like going to the corner shop with your Rolls Royce. Why would you buy a Rolls Royce to travel to the corner shop? Firstly, you should be walking there. But why would you buy? It's the only journey that you're going to do in your life is to go to the corner shop. Why do you need such an expensive car? You could get a moped. But the Quran is such an enormous book and we use it just for sawab or isa al sawab. Let's be honest. And when it comes to examining the Quran, we say, oh no, 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 that's not for us. That as a starting point, especially the older generation people, they're victims of this jalat we don't understand Arabic. And on this basis, they will read year after year, no interest in reading in, in, in this, what are we reading? No interest. But it's an accounting exercise. It's giving us sawab, sawab, sawab. What sawab? What is the effect of this? Don't no, know. We'll find out in the next world. Or as Marxists say, a pie in the sky when you die. No, no. Don't know and frankly don't care. Because that's what I do. It gives me peace. It gives me sawab. That's fine. But the irony is that we read it and have no interest. I mean, if there was even some interest, we would tell at least no interest. And when I see lectures of ulama generally, and I make this comment, of people listening to lectures about the Quran, if you look at, you know, when you, uh, 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 psychologically, when you narrate news to someone, so you can see the effect of that news on their face. So when a person is sitting in the Crown Court on a charge for murder, you can see on his face, right? He'd be charged for murder. He won't be laughing and giggling and being happy. You can see his face will react to the case against him. But if someone gives you good news, before even responding, your face will respond. There will be a smile on your face. But when I've seen scholars talk about the Quran, people are sat in masjids as if they need antidepressants. No smile. No sense of happiness. No sense of more. Give me more. No sense of thirst. It's like, yeah, oh, 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 oh. dead. Absolutely. And when you go and poke them, prod them, Oi, you've been reading year after year, why don't you want to understand? I don't speak Arabic. If knowledge of Arabic was the key to understanding and implementing the Quran, there would be no Arab in the world who would be misguided. If Arabs... But look, when you read in your native language, 
a newspaper, there's no struggle. You just read it. No problem. Arabs read the Quran, those who've studied Arabic. I had a, 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 a client today who was Arab but who couldn't speak Arabic. I said, mashallah, this is very good. <laughs> and, and, and she bought her father for me to speak in Arabic to her. I said, here, I can't communicate with him. You speak to my father in Arabic. So if Arabic was the criterion of accessing the Qur'an, no Arab would walk on this earth misguided. In fact, you will find hundreds and thousands of misguided Arabs who speak Arabic, who understand Arabic, and yet they have no relationship with the Qur'an. That's why... Paradoxically, you see the Asian Muslim, he would love to hear Qari's. But what does that mean? Not interested. No element of interest. Yani, the content is discarded. What is it? Discarded. I'm not interested in the content, I'm just interested in the Arabic text. Don't get me wrong. There is no harm in reading the Qur'an, Tilawat, there is so harm. But the object of the revelation of the Qur'an was not Tilawat, only. Why? Because if the sole objective of Qur'an and its revelation was Tilawat, then Allah would have preserved the Zabur. Allah would have said, Zabur is enough, read the Zabur, or Torah, read it. Why go to the uh, 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 effort to bring the Quran through the Prophet ﷺ if it was only there to be read. That is why on the day of judgment the Prophet ﷺ will stand up in front of Allah and he will complain. And you have to ask yourself when he complains, and this complaint will be about the Quran. This complaint will be about Quran. the Quran. Not about the Quran, about his ummah. And he will make a complaint in front of Allah. And Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبْ And Rasul will say, Ya Rabb, إِنَّ قَوْمِ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا Oh Allah, my قوم, they disregarded the Quran. They knew the content of the Qur'an and they disregarded it from their lives. It had no meaning for them. It had no substance for them. They were more interested in their own language. They were more interested in their own dunya dari. They were interested in their world. They had no interest in my Qur'an. Rasulullah will complain to Allah on the Day of Judgment. Inna qawmi Surah Furqan وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبْ أَوْ اللَّهِ إِنَّ قَوْمِ And he will point إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخِذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَحْجُورًا They disregarded it. They discarded it. Ask yourself, will you be in the line of the finger of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You don't hope, but I'm sorry to say this, that we are that generation that actually have no interest in the Qur'an, mm -hmm. in the content of the Qur'an. When it comes to respecting it, oh yes, kiss it, hug it, put it on them. Hazrat Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhu said, there was a person who learnt the Qur'an, he even learnt the Qur'an, but he did not practice it. For him, Learning the Qur'an was just about so that people could say, MashaAllah, he's Shaykh al-Qur'an. And he used to go and put it up on the shelf. And the Qur'an will complain against him on the Day of Judgment. Oh Allah, he knew bits of me and all he did was just talk about me, but he didn't implement it in our life. So if you are here simply to gather more knowledge, then that is not the purpose of this exercise.
what we are doing here today. It's not just to give you more knowledge. It's for you to be able to say, what is my relationship to the Quran? Mm -hmm. There are people who are sat here today, next lesson, there will be less, maybe six months down the line. The shaitan will say to you, are you busy? You've got a wedding. Are you busy? You've got this. And we'll put different excuses your way. Because the shaitan does not want you to... You can, he doesn't mind anything else. But when it comes to Qur'an, he doesn't want you to have a relationship with the Qur'an. That's why when you look at data analysis, you know, data analysis is a, is, is a, is a hot profession. When you look at the data analysis of the Ummah, you will realize very, very quickly that Allah is perfect, His Rasul is perfect. Allah is perfect, His Rasul is perfect, the Qur'an is perfect, but the people who say the Qur'an is ours, why are they not perfect? The answer is that if you want to look at the history of these people who call themselves the people of the Qur'an, their success was when they were close to the Qur'an and their failure was when they were distant from the Qur'an. And I'm very sorry to tell you, some of you may be offended, but do I give up monkeys, that you belong to a generation that has no interest in the Qur'an. I'm not talking about you sat here. You belong to a generation that will respect the Qur'an, that will recite the Qur'an. But when it comes to investigating and going on a journey into the Qur'an, no interest whatsoever. Oh man, man, this is another scholar ranting and raving. But no, I'm not here to copy and paste what is written in the Tafasir. I assure you that. Because I know that you are better than me, you can pick up those Tafasirs. And I know that there are many ulama, even now, who can copy and paste much better than me. So, for me to simply repeat what is there in the Tafsirs, I'm sorry, this is not the forum. What we are here to do is to go on a journey. The journey of our life with the Qur'an and see how it fits in. So every verse that we look at, the question in the back of our mind is, how does it relate to me? You see, I could say to you, there is a fantastic takeaway in town. You'll say, sorry, I'm eaten. If you've eaten, if you've got no appetite, there's no use me talking about what the Quran, uh, 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 you know, uh, what good food places there are. <coughs> the first thing you have to ask yourself is, when you leave here today, do you leave with a greater appetite? Or do you say, like most people say, good lecture, and that's it, forget about it. Or does that thirst enhance? If the thirst enhances within you, then that's fine. If not, then think that shaitan has intoxicated you to an extent that you are not aware. That is why um, Alama Iqbal, he portrays a very uh, uh, ajeeb uh, dilemma. And he says that one day he records the majlis, the jalsa of Iblis. So Iblis is talking to his friends. Iblis is a, a person, although he's not a human, he's a jinn. And he chats and he has a social life and he has a life. And uh, Iblis is talking to his uh, 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 friends. And he is commenting and Allah Iqbal, it's as if he's sat there and he's listening to that and he transmits it in his poetry. And he says, I know this Ummah, they are not the one who carry the Quran. They will jum jum ke sunenge. Wow, wow, subhanallah. The Qaris, they will recite. Oh, beautiful recipe. But, ye janta hum ke ye ummat 
ہاں ملے قرآن نہیں ہے وہی سرمایہ داری بندہ مومن کا دین Your whole deen is just sermaya dari. It's transactions. I come to the mosque because people will say, look, he's X. I come because I've got politics. I, I do this in deen because it gives me this, it gives me that. It's all sermaya dari. It's, it's worldly transactions. No one is really... So Shaitan is telling me, That's my power. That these people are not interested in the Qur'an. And as long as they are distant from the Qur'an, they are mine. They can read all the namaz they like. Namaz after namaz, namaz after namaz, namaz after namaz, nothing. Hajj after hajj, hajj after hajj. The same old barbarian exists within him. Hajj after hajj, hajj after hajj. Still an animal when it comes to worldly life. More, more, more. You know, what they call the dog of the dunya. Yeah. Rosa after Rosa, Rosa after Rosa, Rosa after Rosa. The same animal exists within. I'm sorry, no difference. So therefore, he says, you know, this, his deen is just transactions. And then he says, Janta hun ke mashrik ki andheri raat mein And he's talking about Mashrik, where Deen apparently came from. He talks, he, he does a critique of the West. He said, but Janta hun ke Mashrik ki andheri raat mein be yade baida hai pirane haram ki aasti. He said, once upon a time, when the people of the Quran, they used to talk, light used to emanate from them. Huh? Light used to emanate from them. Hazrat Sultan Bahu, when he used to talk, Non-Muslims just used to look at him and become Muslim. There was radiance. See ma hum fi wujuhi him min asr sujood the Quran says. You see on their faces the effect of sajdas and rukus. Now all you see on their faces is the impact of Netflix. The impact of TikTok. The impact of Instagram. The impact of Facebook, where if they don't get enough likes, they feel insecure. Where if someone talks about them, they can't sleep at night. Where if someone likes them, it gives them happiness. Artificial lifestyles. So, we live in a world where people have shifted away from the Quran. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we here simply to tick a box? Yeah, 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 we went to just check it out. Or do you really want to have a relationship with the Quran? And if you don't want to have a relationship with the Quran, then you are wasting your time sitting here or listening on the portals. Because this is about having a relationship. And there were those who used to recite the Qur'an, who weren't even Arabs. Hassan al-Basri once went to the masjid. And he, he, of course, he was an Arab. And uh, he was uh, 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 reading namaz behind, I believe it was someone by the name of Hazrat al-Bushri Hafi, a very great wali Allah. And Bushri Hafi was a non-Arab. And he was making mistakes in the Qur'an. And you know, Arabs, sometimes they can have a chip on their shoulder. We know it all because we're Arabs, you know, that kind of attitude. But Hasna Basri, he heard the recitation of the Quran was wrong. And in the Jama'at, he said, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa he left. He said, how can I read namaz behind such a person whose Arabic is so defective? And then Allah Azza wa Jal sent a message to Hasna Basri. Oh, Hasna Basri. If only you would have completed that namaz behind Bushri Afi, I would have rated that namaz over all of the namaz of your life. <laughs> Why? Because you were looking at his recitation. I was looking at his inside. <laughs> How he was feeling when he was reciting. It was a conversation. I was engaged in that. So therefore, we live in a world where it's all about showmanship, looks, Facades, 
But if we have a quest to want to know the Quran, then when we take the first step, I guarantee you the Quran will take 10 steps towards you. The Quran, and don't get me wrong, we are living, but the Quran is more living than us. It is a living phenomena. It talks, it listens to its qari, and it engages, it protects. What is ta'deez? For goodness sake, people have this culture of ta'deez that ta'deez are going to do this. Up. I'm not talking against that. But what is a ta'deez? A ta'deez is an inscription of verses of the Quran on a piece of paper. If they can yield power, those verses can yield power on a piece of paper. What if those verses were in your heart? Would they not yield power? But no. You know, no, not at all. Sayyidina uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, he, there used to be a beggar. He used to come to him every other day. Give me, give me, give me more. You know, beggars are, give me more, give me more. And one day, as a day, Omar Farouk, he just got a bit, I don't know, he must have been frustrated for some reason. And he says, go and read the Quran. Stop wasting my time. He rebuked him. He didn't give him any money. So the next day, that beggar didn't come. The next day, he didn't come. A week passed. A little bit Farouk felt very bad. He thought, I rebuked him. And uh, he's not come back to me. So he went to find him. Hazrat Umar Farooq went to find him. And when he, radiallahu anhu, went to find him, he saw him sat reading the Quran. And he says, why didn't you come to me for money anymore? He said, oh, Umar, radiallahu when I was dislodged with the Quran, I was begging you and others but since I have become related to the Qur'an, I don't need to go to anyone else. People want quick fixes in problems. The Qur'an is there. The Qur'an solves problems. But we have a need-to-know basis relationship with the Qur'an. As I said, Sawab, Isa is Sawab. But the Qur'an has, this is not a sales pitch by the way. The Qur'an itself describes وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ This is shifa. How many people today can get shifa? When uh, a sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ was bit by a snake, another sahabi read Surah Fatiha, blew on the bite, and the poison, the toxins, came out of that. <coughs> they reported the matter back to the Prophet ﷺ who smiled and who said, my Sahabi knows the power of Surah Fatiha. Forget Muslims, non-Muslims. Non-Muslims. I once read that Guru Gobind Singh, he had mastered the art of a verse of the Quran, Nasrun min Allahi wa fatun qareeb, and he used to become invisible. Invisible. Just by reading a verse of the Quran. So the Qur'an is not just there for Muslims, it is there for all of the human race. In fact, not only the human race, the whole alameen, but that's a separate topic, we'll talk about that. So when we do tafsir of the Qur'an, I want you to note a few things in the back of your mind. This is just what we call an introductory taster. Remind yourself of the contents of this. When we do tafsir of the Qur'an, you must remember there are two kinds of tafsirs. Ulama will only tell you one kind. I'm very sorry to say this, but it's a wake up call. There's two kinds of tafsir tafsir e zahir and tafsir e batin. Tafsir e zahir is what the verse says and what it means. That's all. The ulama are not interested in going beyond that. For them, it's job done. That was our contract, that was what we were paid for. That was what we were contracted to do, not interested in going further. But there is another tafsir of the Quran which is called tafsir e batin. And this isn't just me talking. Great commentators and great uh, uh, noble scholars such as Shah 
Hazrat Shah Waliullah Muhaddis Nehemi Rahmatullah talked about this in his book Al Fazul Kabir. He said there is a Zahir of the Quran and there is a Batin of the Quran. The Zahir of the Quran is taught by the ulama of the Zahir. They will just tell you. But should I tell you something about the ulama of the Zahir? Most of them, 98% of them, the ulama of the Zahir, they limit their exposition of the Quran to 500 verses. After 500 verse, verses, they say, don't know. And if you try to speak, they will say, shut up. Why? Because 500 verses is what we call muhkamat, laws. That's it. Just talk about aqimu salat, adu zakat, warka'u ma'al-raqeen. They will talk about the laws in the Quran. But there's 500 verses. If the Quran was only revealed for uh, law, then Allah would have just revealed 500 verses. But where there are verses called muhkamat, there are also the majority of verses in the Quran that are called mutashabihat. Now, mutashabihat are verses that you cannot deduce law from you cannot extract necessarily aqidah from, but it is important to go on a quest, a journey to understand. And where necessary, I will demonstrate to you that we need certain tools to understand the Quran. And I'm not going to start talking about those tools now, because most of you will think, oh, this is just theory. But we're going to be practical. Let me just give you a practical example. Nothing is like Allah. You've heard this verse, right? Laysa, Laysa, Kamithlihi Shay. No share is Kamithl, is like him. Everyone happy with that translation? Laysa, Kamithlihi. Focus on this word, Kamithli. Ka? Mithlihi, nothing is like Allah. And yet the Quran itself, in a different part, says, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Nothing is like it. And this verse says, an example of his light is Kamishkatin Fiha Misma. So, on the face of it, there's a contradiction, isn't there? On the one hand, Allah says, There is nothing like it. And on the, on the other verse, Allah says, An example of his light is Kamishkatin Fiha Misma. So, how do we reconcile? This contradiction is in our mind. The Quran doesn't have contradiction. But in order to reconcile this contradiction in our mind, we need to understand certain basic principles. And I will, of course, elaborate upon them to see where contradictions could occur. But, so you have tafsir al Zahir and tafsir al Batin. In Zahir, you have Muhkamah. And in Batin, you have Mutashabihat. And those Mutashabihat are invitations for you. And that's why Allah says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ We reveal these stories in the Qur'an. Oh, beloved, I'm not translating the verse, I'm just presenting the mafhum, the synopsis of the verse. We um, transmitted these uh, uh, stories. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنُ الْقَصَصِ بِمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ Why did we do these? وَإِن كُنْتَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الْغَافِحِينَ So that you can, your people, not you, as in the Prophet your people who were in darkness, in ghafla, can come into light. And so therefore, there is light in each story of the Qur'an. 
in each verse of the Quran. And then you have a third category of verse which even the Ahle Batil don't talk about. So you have Ahle Zayr who talk about 500, and then the Ahle Batil who talk about Mutashabihat. Of course, they don't talk about Mutashabihat to impose law, they talk about Mutashabihat to enhance a culture of understanding. But then there is one breed of verses, they are called Muqatta'at. And uh, the easiest way to understand Muqatta'at is Alif Lam Mim, Yasin, Taha, Qaf Ha, Ya, Ayn, Saad. What is this? The Alim will say, This is guidance for you. Uh, excuse me. What's Taha? What, what does this mean? What does it mean to me? What is the relevance of Ya Seen to me? That's the question you need to ask him. And the Ahlul Bayt will say, "Oh, it's a secret. Allah is the sooner the best. Indeed, Allah is the sooner the best. But it's an invitation. Come, investigate, learn. And those who learnt muqattaat, they realized that forget about the whole Quran." being a code for this universe, you can summarize the whole of the law of Mahfuz just in Alif Lam Mim. And in fact, Alif Lam Mim is even an, a, a, an exaggeration. Hazrat Ali Karim Allah Wajal Karim says, he says the whole of the Quran can be summarized in Surah Fatiha. The whole of the Quran can be summarized in Surah Fatiha. So when we go through the Quran, you will see that every topic of the Quran can be related back to Surah Fatiha. So Hazrat Ali says, the whole Quran, the summary of the whole Quran is Surah Fatiha. And he says the summary of Surah Fatiha is Bismillah rahman rahim <laughs> The summary of Surah Fatiha is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And he says this, this is the Ali talking. He says the summary of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is the bay of Bismillah. And he says that the summary of the bay of Bismillah is the dot underneath Bismillah. So forget about Alif, La, Mim. That's very long. One dot is a summary of the entire Quran. But do we have that appetite to investigate that dot? No. You know, this gentleman who sat here, he recited poetry, 99.9% .9 people didn't understand what he was reciting. And they were saying, SubhanAllah, MashaAllah, only because it was in their language, they didn't understand it. You know, I, I know that I speak to people individually, you know, Chef al Manuk, they, 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 people who speak Patwari, they think they, they, they understand it. No, they don't. It doesn't matter if you don't understand it. It's fine. I'm not criticizing you. But there's no desire. Chef al Manuk is enriched by the Quran. Chef al Manuk is enriched by the Quran. You know, I said in my Jummah, three, four Jummahs ago, I said, the, uh, 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 the person who wrote Sefer me and Muhammad al fikr in two words he summarized the whole of Tawheed in two uh, words and people just didn't get it he's like mashallah it's my language it feels nice but do I want to know what it actually means no and don't get me wrong I'm not saying because they were difficult words the words were simple and especially these older people, they know the words even, but they're not interested in the meaning. They're not interested in to dive into it. I sat with one very old gentleman, he's about, nine, he's about 90 years old now. He's a master of Sefer and Maluk. So I said to him, do you know that uh, 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 there's geology? Mia Sam talks about geology in Sefer and Maluk. No, no. I think you were the wrong person here. And when I told him the verse, he was... Sweating, he said, I've been reading this verse all my life, but I've never understood what it actually meant. So, your elders, not even your elders, your grandparents, they used to sit with their elders 
And they used to say, can you reconcile this poetry with the Qur'an? But now, nothing. No, not even an inquisition into the meaning of the language, even if it's in your own language. So this is an excuse that, oh, Qur'an is in Arabic. Something that was brought to you to represent values of the Qur'an in your own language, not even interested in that. And when you hear Sayyid most people weren't even uh, 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 switched on. They were thinking about other things whilst he was reciting. And, uh, 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 and, and, but I tell you what, if he, if he was a singer, a world-class singer, in, in front of him there would be notes. Twenties, thirties. Wah, 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 subhanallah, subhanallah. This is Salma al This is Deen that we've created. Here you are, notes. And the ulama said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can slip some his way, you can slip some my way. It's all become a trade, a business. No one wants to listen to hardcore knowledge of the Quran. So I congratulate you for being here. But open your eyes, open your ears. Not just because you want more information, or you can put on your CD, CV that I attended a, a, a lecture and I've got more knowledge. Do it with a view that your journey of life is accompanied. Make the Qur'an a companion of your life from today. And if you make the Qur'an a companion, I'm not going to sales pitch it and say, you'll get this, you'll get this, you'll get this. You tell me one thing. Mark my words. One year after sitting in this majlis, having gone through the Qur'an, if there is no change in your life, then you come and talk to me. But I have never met a person who has engaged in the Qur'an and who hasn't been coloured. Who hasn't been impacted. I knew a person, he had a, a, a certain psychological problems. And I told him to recite certain verses of the Qur'an. And his psychologist was shocked that there was no need for medicine. No need for therapy. Just by the barakah of reading those verses, he was cured of those diseases. So the Qur'an has a lot more to offer us than a pie in the sky when we die. It has something to offer us here and now. So that's why I started this journey off with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And the dot under Bismillah is a summary of the Qur'an. So how do you understand that dot? How do you understand... How do you uh, analyze a dot? That's a question that you need to ask yourself. You don't just say, Subhanallah, that sounds very good. How does a dot summarize everything? You see, in the world that we live, science has taught us it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Once upon a time, I don't know if people in this room who are elder, know, remember this, I'm sure they do, you know, the computers were, they used to fill a whole room. Then slowly they became smaller, 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 and now a time comes where that one small chip has so much information. So science has taught us, it's not about how much you have, it's what you have within what you have. And just because you can't see more than a dot doesn't mean to say you walk away. You say, let me inquire into that dot. What does that dot actually mean? And that's why we begin this journey through Surah Fatiha. And remember, Surah Fatiha is a summary of... So whatever topic you look at in the Quran, how do you, how, how do you find this in Surah Fatiha? I can guarantee you, you bring any verse to me, I'll show you its relationship with Surah Fatiha. Why? This is not my grace, this is the grace of Surah Fatiha. Because it has so much content in it that Hazrat Ali Karim says, if I loaded 40 camels with the tafsir of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, even 40 camels would be less for that. So, the Qur'an has a lot more to offer us than that which meets the eye. Are you ready for this journey? Ask yourself this question today. 
Because in the next week, Shaitan will say to you, Oh, you've got an appointment. Oh, you know, uh, uh, my khala's uh, uh, daughter's getting married. Yeah, that one. Yeah, who you can't bear seeing the face of. But for dunya, now you want to turn up. Yeah. Any excuse to take you away from this session. Why? Because Shaitan knows that if there's any way to uh, 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 um, have his hold over you, and that is to keep your distance from the Quran. So let's change the course of history. Since people came to England so from the 1960s, they didn't know how to read. I mean, it was a miracle the fact that they even able, were able to read the Quran. I know many old people. They used to read Quran. They couldn't even read Quran, but slowly they read, read Quran. But the problem is they did a full stop, end of chapter, not interested in beyond that. And when an alim talked about verses, it was the same verses again and again and again. There was no thirst. There was no uh, quest. You know, I asked a question in my Jummah, three Jummahs ago. I didn't know whether you know this. I asked a question. And I, this isn't just me having a go at the people of Coventry. This is everywhere. You go everywhere. The same issue. I asked a question. <clears throat> Can you believe no one actually came to me afterwards and said, you know, that was a very interesting question. Can you give me... I didn't give the answer, by the way. But no, these, mashallah, these students, our brothers from Hedaba, they asked me, they, they, because they, they, there was this quest. But I thought, if I would have sworn at someone's family, that person would have said, eh, excuse me, you swore at my family or Duma, you know, you know, the country. But when I uh, said this question, it was a huge question. And it was about you. It wasn't about Joe Bloggs. It was about you. That on the day of judgment, there will be some people who will recognize Allah. How would they be able to recognize Allah? Well, I'm not talk about this. They'll say, oh, no, 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 don't go there. <clears throat> I asked one Sheikh Ladis about this, and he says, don't talk to people about this, because people will become confused. When it comes to defrauding HRM, HMRCS, they have all the logic and wisdom and the, you know. But when it comes to applying this nut for the Quran, oh no, no, you know, this is for scholars. No. You know, when it comes to claiming welfare benefits, they, they know all the information in there. And they it. So, uh, and the ulama have a reaction, oh, don't talk to, to people about this, it'll confuse them. You know, 20 years ago, I delivered a Jummah, I was only. 25 years ago, actually. And my topic was, you know what my topic was? Talaq. The issue of Talaq. And as I left this masjid, after Jummah, two old Ajis came up to me and said, we happily came to the Jummah, happily married. Now we don't even know if we're married after that lecture. <laughs> and we don't even know if we're married. I said, well, I think you need to wake up and drink some coffee. And then they say, oh, there's no baraka in our home. How could there be baraka? You've been living with a woman for the last 20 years and you're not even married to her. Why? Because you divorced her. You didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like someone said to me, <laughs> you know, I divorced my wife in anger. So there's got to be a way out. I said, no one has a candle like dinner and then divorces. <laughs> of course, all divorce isn't anger. But no, they won't raise out. It's just, this is what you call majura. In the qawm in taqadu al quran Majura. Making a mockery of it. Is there a way out? Is there a way out? And after that day, I was told one old man, he said, don't you dare deliver a lecture on the architect. <laughs> Can you believe that? No, not interested. Yet, we utter words where we can act, and you know what, people often use this excuse, I didn't know. It's like you're driving on the road, a car, and you go through a, a, a pelican crossing, which most Asians do. <laughs> and then the officer stops you, and says, excuse me, do you know the meaning of this pelican crossing? He says, well, no, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so then what the bloody hell are you doing in this, in this driver's seat? 
When you sit in this seat, it is your responsibility to know. When you, my brothers and sisters, when you read Kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then it is your responsibility to know. Ignorance of law is no excuse. I'm not saying now we uh, uh, examine our, <coughs> our uh, you know, matrimonial status. What I'm saying is knowledge. This is the Quran. You know, I had a guy, he, <coughs> I, uh, I haven't written many fatwas in my life, but one fatwa which I wrote at, at the age of 21 is this guy, he was a revert, and uh, he, uh, he found out that you could divorce your wife three times, uh, and uh, that's finished, the end of marriage. And he found that so funny. Because, you know, in English law, you have to go through torture and hell before you get a divorce. As if the marriage itself wasn't torture and hell. You've got the du du divorce process, and you've got the lawyers there milking it. Yep, we need to, uh, you know, stretch this process. And now the new law, mashallah, which is coming out from April, it's going to extend the divorce process even more. For whose benefit? Not for the couple. I don't know who benefits from that. Actually, I do know who benefits from that. But, uh, uh, so what was I saying? This is, by the way, a tactic just for me to see if you actually follow what I'm saying or actually if you're uh, uh, digesting it. What was I saying? So this revert, he found it very amusing. He goes, so if I say three times, divorce, 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 it's over. Because he belonged to a culture where you have to go through court, you have to pay lawyers ridiculous monies, and then you have to fight it out. So uh, he found it really amusing. He went home and he was so amused, and this is a real life football. In joke, in jest, he said to his wife nine times, I divorced you, I'm laughing. And then after nine times, he said, Does that mean we're divorced, darling? And she looked at me and she says, What do you call me, darling, for after all those divorces? <laughs> anyway, so she contacted me and she said, You know, you're Italian, he makes jokes about. I said, What jokes? He said, My jokes about divorce. The other day he came home and uh, he said nine times to me, I divorce you, I divorce you. But he was laughing. I said, mashallah, <laughs> come. <laughs> and I wrote to photo that even a divorce said in jest is a divorce. He wasn't a happy chappy. Oh no, well she was actually. <laughs> she used to say good riddance. But he was very shocked. But this is the Quran. The Quran says, Talaq is twice. But we d don't know and don't care about these. When we get into a problem, then we suddenly come back and say, find a solution for me. So, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Let's embark upon this journey. Just two, two or three sentences. Uh, you have a very qualified and a very competent uh, uh, alim in your midst uh, who uh, who you know, some ulama, they acquire knowledge, and alhamdulillah, in knowledge for him is in his DNA. So alhamdulillah, a very learned person, and he has spoken, he will continue to speak, but because the brother has requested, first and foremost, the Prophet sallam, used to visit the graveyard in the midst of Shaba. How many people tonight have intention to go to the graveyard? Right there. That's a good starting point. It's not mandatory that you must go, but the culture of going to graveyards. You see, if I said the Nafalpuro, people would say the Masha, totally Nafalpuro. But Shabbira, this Nisf of Shaban, is synonymous with the visitation of the graveyard. You can go to the graveyard anytime, there's no restriction of time or a, 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 a day in which you can visit the graveyard. The Prophet used to say, Kuntu nahaytukum an ziyaratil qubur. I used to stop you from visiting graves. Al-ana, after today, fuzuru You should visit graves, I command you. So the command to visit grave is mutlaq, <coughs> it's general. 
But on the night of Shaba, on the 15th night of Shaba, it is specifically the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to visit the graveyard. We just don't have a culture of it. Forget about Shaban, we don't have a culture otherwise to visit graves. When you ask people why, I ask a person, why don't you visit the graveyard? He goes, no, my dad's not dead yet. <laughs> it's as if he was waiting for his dad to die and then he's not visiting there. He wouldn't visit him now, you know, in his life. But he's not visiting there. You know. Anyway, so we have this culture, it's prejudice. We say, uh, no, 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 uh, I have no relative in that graveyard. No, it doesn't matter whether you have a relative or not. You should visit the graveyard of Mu'mineen. Not, of course, Kufar. Of Mu'mineen. Yeah? So, you should visit the graveyard of uh, 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 Mu'mineen. And when you go there, you should, of course, uh, uh, send them Isa al sawab and you should talk to them. Because they can hear you better than people who are living can hear you. Their hearing is much better than living people. Yeah, absolutely. Hearing uh, living people, their capacity to hear has limitations. But those in their graves, their capacity to hear is hyper-enhanced. So they hear you and they see you. And <clears throat> we will talk about this during the uh, appropriate verse where the hearing and the seeing of the people of the graves is talked about. But, so the first thing of Nisf Shaban is to go to a graveyard. Now, I, I know there's one graveyard in Coventry, but uh, honestly, I, there's no culture of going there. The only person who would go there is someone who's deceased has died recently, and after about six weeks, they forget that anyway. Actually, six weeks is a lot. Anyway, so people say, oh, they're not related to me. But every moment is related to you. So you should go. That's, a, that's sunnah. Then reading nawafil is also part of this night. We are after this session. Hazrat Mawlana Zafar Siddiqui Sahib will be leading Salatul Tasbih. And I was talking to him earlier today that according to Hanafi fiqh, Salatul Tasbih should not be led in Jama'ah. According to Hanafi fiqh. But there is something above ishtihad in certain contexts and a lot of Hanafi ulama have realized that it is beneficial for people to read Salatul Tasbih in Jama'ah because otherwise if they are told read it yourself they'll probably go home and go to sleep or they'll go home and read two nafal and that's it but Salatul Tasbih has many many benefits and of course those benefits are enhanced on nights like this bit, Shaban, the half of Shaban. So we will read uh, Asad al Tasbih with Jama'ah. So reading of Nawafil, reading of Quran, these are the activities that we do. In terms of what you mentioned, that uh, uh, our, um, uh, our uh, year's worth of actions will be uh, written, I just want to clarify that because people think. Well, you know, ulama say, it will be decided this year if you will die, it will be decided if you will get married, it will be decided if you have a, a child. It, it comes across very confusing. What is written has already been decided. The only thing that is done on this night is that data is brought from the first heavens down. And it is implemented for that year. And the purpose behind, uh, and the verse of the Quran uh, uh, behind this, uh, 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 the purpose behind us doing ibadat on this night is that if something arduous is written for us, that which is brought down, which is arduous for us, through our worship, Allah could make that easy. Why? Because He Himself says in the Quran, Yamhullahu. <laughs> Allah can change whatever is written. So Allah has that power to change whatever He so likes. And especially with Nawafil, Allah Azza wa Jal says, Allah says that there is nothing my servant could ask from me after reading Nawafil that I will not give him. 
There's nothing except for death. He can't say, well, no, don't give me death. He's wasting his time. Because death is mubram. It is written. But other than death, whatever he asks me after nawafil, I will grant it to him. And that's why reading the Hajjud Namaz on this night is very, very virtuous. So it's a night of worship. It's a night of Imam. You can narrate some Bakya, some Aliya. Okay. <coughs> I want to narrate something that is relating to the Qur'an of Awliya. Because in my submission to you, the people who walked on this earth, who understood the Qur'an in the best way, they were the Awliya. Better than ulama. Better than ulama. They were Awliya who understood the Qur'an. So there was one Waliyullah, you heard his name. His name was Imam Malik. Imam Malik. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Imam Malik, he was a Waliyullah also. People used to queue to come in his company and learn the pearls of the Quran. They used to queue. There was no appointment system, but people used to queue to sit in the company of Imam Malik to learn the secrets of the Qur'an. Quran. But there was one person in the time of Imam Malik, he was known by the people as a madman, but he was amongst the awliya, and his name was Hazrat Zunun Misri. A very powerful name, Zunun. Noon. This is a uh, noon. and Zunun very very by the way names are very important sometimes people ha put names and they can't tolerate those names and those names have an adverse impact on them so names are very important so as of the Zunun everyone in the public used to think oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about mm -hmm. and Zunun used to go about and you know la -di -da -di -da. no one used to give him importance but when Imam Malik, who was one of the <coughs> most renowned shayukh of Medina, when he knew or heard Zunun is in Medina Munawwara, he used to go barefoot and receive Zunun. <laughs> and someone asked Imam Malik, they can be stuck up. So then, <laughs> How can you go and sit in the company of him? You have them. Look who you are. Malik. And look at him. Zunun. No comparison. In class. Knowledge is a commodity. <laughs> Unfortunately, ulama, there, there are ulama who suffer from this mental complex that you think, because I have knowledge, I am better. It's, you, you'll find it. I've seen it all my life. But... Uh, Hazrat Imam Malik was asked, We seek your company because you know the Quran. What does he know that you seek his company? What does he. Is there anything greater than the Quran? Is there? Imam Malik, you know the Quran. We seek your company. What do you seek from him? He said, you seek my company because I know the Qur'an, the book of Allah. What is the Qur'an? The book of Allah. You seek my company because I know the book of Allah. I seek his company because he knows Allah. <laughs> what is the use of knowing the book of Allah if you don't know Allah? <laughs> What is the use of knowing the book if you don't want to know the author of the book? So Imam Malik used to say, I used to sit in his company because he knows Allah. He knows Allah. And that's why when I used to talk to Zunun Misri, in his simple words, many, many verses of the Quran would be recited. I could relate to his words. 
words, through many words, and yet they were simple words. So the awliya had this ability through simplicity to demonstrate knowledge. Shall I give you an example? Just one example. It's not all about talking. Sometimes, just sitting in their company, you could learn. There was one uh, 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 and um, someone approached him and said, I would like to uh, learn more about the Quran, but I have three problems. I have three questions. If you can answer my three questions, I will happily consider uh, 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 the Islam. He said, what are your three questions? He said, first question is, you say, Allah is everywhere, show me. Allah is everywhere, show me. So the second question is, you say, Shaitan will go to hell. True? Shaitan will go to hell? He says, yeah. He said, what is Shaitan? He says, Shaitan is uh, um, a jinn. Okay. What are jinns made of? What are jinns made of? Fire. Halakal janna min maari jinn. So, jan, you know, like we have uh, Adam, alayhi salam, was the first human, the first jinn. His name was Jan. Jan. That doesn't mean to say that's your fiance, I never heard. Jan. Halakal janna min maari jinn. So Jan was the first jinn. So he, Jan was made of fire. And by the way, jinns are not the only creation. There are many hybrid or other similar creations which uh, 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 science hasn't discovered yet. They may be within the province of myth or uh, science fiction, but the Quran and Hadith have a lot of content about them. But of course, we are not aware like jinn, shin, hin. There are different uh, categories of creation. So he said... If a jinn is made from fire, when fire will go into Jahannam, Jahannam is fire, fire goes into fire, how is there any pain? Do you understand the question? Yeah. So when fire goes into fire, where's the azar? Where's the pain? He said, that's my second question. He said, my third question is, you say that everything is written in taqdeer, uh, <laughs> in fate. He said, so it's written, you're a Muslim, I'm a non-Muslim. Why do we need to bother about becoming a Muslim? Because it was written, I'm a non-Muslim, you're a non-Muslim. So can you answer these three questions for me? So that, when you laugh, he slapped him across the face. <laughs> he slapped him across the face. Really hard. And then he did this. He says, what did you slap me for? He said, answer your question. He said, no, 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 you didn't answer my question. He said, you slapped me. He said, no, I'll answer your question. He said, if you don't know the answers, don't hit me at least. He said, I answered your question. He said, you mad person. He went to the Qazi. And he said to the Qazi, he said, Qazi, you know, judge. He said, Qazi, this person, I have a complaint about him. I asked him three questions. He couldn't answer, so he hit me. So the Qazi said to that Baliya guy, did you hit him? So then he said, I answered his question. So the Qazi said, can you explain to me how slapping someone on the face is answering this question? Huh? Can, you, can you explain this to me? He said, very simple. He said to me, where is Allah? Show me, prove it. He said, I slapped him. Tell him to prove it. He said, he slapped me here. He said, prove it. He said, I've got pain here. He said, show me your pain. He said, I can't show you the pain, but it's there. <laughs> I can't show you the pain, but it's there. He said, well, you show me your pain, I'll show you. <laughs> you believe in your pain, which cannot be seen. And you deny Allah, just because you can't see Him? He said, his second question was, Shaitan will go to hell, fire goes into fire, how is there any punishment? He said, who is He? He said, he is so-and-so. He said, no, who is he? He said, he's a human. What are humans made of? What are humans made of? Come on. Flesh. He said, who am I? He said, human. 
Says, what am I made of? Flesh. Says, flesh hit flesh. What's the problem? <laughs> flesh hit flesh. What's the problem? He said, fire. We'll go into fire. How is that punishment? He said, well, flesh hit flesh. What's the problem? <laughs> he said, his third question was, well, in Kismet, in faith, Allah, it is written, you're a non-Muslim. I'm a non-Muslim and you're a Muslim. He said, well, if he believed in that, what is he doing here? Because it was written in faith that I was going to slap him. <laughs> Nothing to complain about. So sometimes the awliya wouldn't necessarily use language to portray. That is why sitting in their company is not just about hearing what they say, see what they do, how they conduct themselves, how they behave. You know, I was sat um, one day in, uh, 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 there is a great uh, 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 darbar in Lahore, the Datasa, and uh, it's a very you know, uh, sacred place. And there was a person who was, had a blanket over him, and it was a bit of a smelly blanket. And he was sat, and uh, he was, you know, like here on the phone, he was saying, you know, like, Chama, Chalo, Manletema. And I was really angry because I thought, not only is he on the phone, he's got a blanket on top of him. And his voice was very heavy, you know, heavy voice. And he was talking really loudly right in front of the mazar of Hazrat Sheikh Ali Hajveri. And I got really angry with him. I thought, when he comes off this telephone call, I'm going to say, but the means are we don't even know where you sat. And you sat, you know, Khadija Gharib Nawaz used to sit here and do chilla. And you were sat here on a telephone call. And he was, it wasn't just a telephone call, you know, like, no. And he was like ma making really. <laughs> Achha, jo, tike, and he was laughing. And I got really, I thought, really cutted this guy off. Anyway, after about 10 minutes, he stopped talking. I thought, right. Then he took his blanket off. And I just saw a person, you know, we, who do we describe in English as a tramp? As a total tramp, no phone, no nothing. He looked at me. Pure. What happened? Get away! And I, I was shocked because I was waiting to see where his mobile phone was. But he was not communicating to me. He was communicating in another realm. These people are not necessarily people who communicate in one realm. Allah has given them duty in many, many realms. Yeah. And there's examples of this from Hadith. When I, in one lecture, I explained this, and one person came to me and he said, how is this possible that you know, you're sitting here and you're talking about... I said, it's all there in Hadith. Just wait. Watch this space. <laughs> and I say to you also, any karamat of any wali, you can reconcile it with the Quran. <laughs> any karamat. There is no karamat, karamat means miracle. There is no karamat of a wali that you can't reconcile with the Quran. Everything can be reconciled. In fact, the basis of every miracle is the Quran itself. Subhanallah. It's just how to extract. There was a person who knew the power of Yasin, and just by that power, he could become invisible. He knew the power of the Quran. It's all about knowing the Quran. So that's what we're here for, inshallah. Obviously. inshallah, inshallah. Any questions before we do dua? Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Specifically about tonight. Yes. So we are listening from ulama. Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Hand over the list of those yes. who leave this world. To the world of eternity during this coming year, yes. from this night to coming next next year, sure. Shaban 15. How uh, in, I would like to request you to elaborate it in the light of Quran. The list is maintained, and that is handed over to the angel Israel Alaslam, which is on capturing the souls of the persons leaving this world. Is it true? In the light of the uh, of course, mm. of course, the, uh, 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 the the decision whether that person will die is handed down. It's already made. 
Quran says, لَن يُؤَخِّرِ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهَا The time of death is written. That is something that was written in the Law of Mahfuz. But for it to come down, it will, that order will come down on the 15th <coughs> of Shaban before your demise. And so therefore, the angels would receive that information so before that time, even the angels don't know. Even the angels don't know when this person is going to die. That knowledge of when a person is going to die, in fact, uh, there are five knowledges which Allah has reserved for himself. The Quran talks about those five knowledges. Time doesn't allow me to explain that. Well, uh, 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 but there are five knowledges which Allah has reserved for himself. One of those knowledges is the time of death. Yeah? So that knowledge will come down in the Shabbat before that person passes away. From Lohim Mahfuz. From Lohim Mahfuz. Yeah. To those angels who will execute that order. Or those who have knowledge of that order. اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد المعبد الجود والكرم وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم وصل عليه اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم أرنا حقائق الأشياء كما هي توفنا مسلمين وألحقنا بالصالحين مولا كريم همنا اپنی زندگی کا یہ حصہ تیرے گھر میں گزارا اس جستجو میں کہ تیرے قرآن اور تیری قربت حاصل کرے الہی اس عزم کو سرسبز و شاداں فرما الہی ہمیں وہ توفیق دے وہ ہمت دے وہ اسباب دے کہ جن کے ذریعے ہم تیرا قرب اور تیرے قرآن کا قرب حاصل کر سکیں قرآن کو ہمارے سینے کی زینت بنا ہمارے احوال کی زینت بنا ہمارے ظاہر و باطن کی زینت بنا ہماری قبر کی زینت بنا ہماری آخرت کی زینت بنا الہی قرآن سے وابستگی دنیا اور اقبہ میں عطا فرما یا الہی قرآن فہمی کے رموز اور اس کے نکات ہمارے ازہان و قلوب پہ منکشف فرما الہی ہم اس قابل نہیں ہیں کہ اس برگزیدہ کتاب کو سبھال سکے لیکن تیرے محبوب صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے یہ امانت ہم تک پہنچائی الہی اس امانت سے انصاف کرنے کی توفیق الہی وہ ہر راستے جو بند ہیں مفاہیم کے اور وہ راستے جو رکاوٹ بنے بیٹھے ہیں یا اللہ ان تمام رکاوٹوں کو دور فرما قرآن کا رسہ عطا فرما اہل قرآن کی صحبت عطا فرما اہل قرآن کی معرفت عطا فرما یا الہ العالمین دنیا اور اقبا میں ہمیں عزت و عبرو عطا فرما جنہوں نے آج اس رات اس مسجد میں آکے تیری عبادت کا انتخاب اور ارادہ کیا ہے یا اللہ اس ارادے کو اپنی بارگاہ میں قبول فرما اور جو ہم عبادت کریں گے یا کر چکے ہیں اس میں جو کمی کو تائی واقعہ ہوگی یا اللہ اسے معاف فرما دی یا اللہ اس کے صدقے میں ہمارے کبائر اور سغائر معاف فرما دی یا الہ العالمین ہمارے احوال پہ اپنے محبوب اور محبوبوں کی نگاہ پاک عطا فرما اور یا اکرام کے منحج پہ زندگی بسر کرنے کی توفیق عطا فرما یا الہ العالمین ہمیں نظام دجالیے سے محفوظ فرما ہمارے اندر وہ اوصاف پہلا فرما جس کے ذریعے ہم امام مہدی علیہ السلام کا قرب حاصل کر سکیں اگر ہماری زندگیوں میں وہ قرب ہماری قسمت میں نہ رہا یا اللہ ہمیں وہ توفیق دے کہ ہم آنے والی نسلوں میں وہ اوصاف منتقل کر لیں یا الہ العالمین امام مہدی علیہ السلام کے وہ جملہ اوصاف جس کے ذریعے وہ دجال اور دجالیت کا مقابلہ کریں گے یا اللہ ان کا وارث ہمیں بنا یا الہ العالمین 
علم و عمل کی دولت عطا فرما انکساری کی دولت عطا فرما معرفت کی دولت عطا فرما یقین کی دولت عطا فرما ونفوض عمورنا الى الله ان الله بصير بالعباد صلى الله على حبيبه سيدنا سندنا مولانا مرشدنا محمد وآله وصحبه اجمعين برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين